I know for sure that myself and my colleagues at Miami-Dade College North Campus are delighted to be a part of this event and all of the energy and the buzz and just the transformative nature of an event like this. And it's only right that a part of this conversation about technology, entrepreneurship, dedicates time to talk about the global implications of this work and what's happening in communities like ours around the globe. So this conversation could not be more fitting, and we could not be more privileged to have the opportunity to engage with the speakers that are here today. And we have a really important announcement to make. I don't know if I'm supposed to make that or if someone else is going to announce that. No, you can announce it. Okay, I can announce it. Awesome. That's the benefit of being a chairman. <laughs> there has some privileges. Uh, this is where we will launch and let all of you know first before the public knows that the Miami-Dade Chamber of Commerce, which is one of the oldest chambers in this area, uh, focused on economic development, particularly in communities of color, uh, will be launching its first trade mission to South Africa in the fall. So this conversation could not come at a better time. And we want not, you're here today, we want you on the trade mission with us in, a, in October, I believe it is. And yeah, Derek sure. and Dr. Pondway Gibson and Daniel Fizami are our three leaders on this global trade mission effort. So you get in right now, I'm sure that, and Ricardo, I'm sorry, Ricardo Forbes, who is also the very generous sponsor of the luncheon today, Baptist Hospital. I'm too busy telling him and his colleagues just how wonderful an organization Baptist Hospital is. And the four of them are gonna lead us in that trade mission to Africa. And the countdown begins today. And because you're here today, I'm sure they have some special incentive to get you to sign up to be on board for the trip in October. And you'll hear more about it as we get closer to the date. So thank you for being here today. I'm gonna to give up the mic and make room for the speakers to um, do what they, we've invited them here to do. Thank you very much. I'm gonna go a little bit more, of inf give you a little bit more information about the uh, Trade um, Commission or our group is focused again on accelerating Miami as the gateway to Africa as well as the diaspora. So the, this is the kickoff event in an informational session just to bring you all aboard to give you the information necessary to partake in that trip to Africa. In June uh, 26, we will be bringing down some speakers. Um, we sent a letter out to the ambassador to South Africa. Um, we're in touch with Danny Glover and I just made a contact with my friend in the back, Emmanuel Pratt. Um, he's going to be reaching out to his friend uh, to come down and to do another informational session and um, build those connections necessary to make that trip worthwhile. Uh, we're also thinking about bringing, uh, bringing everybody together and doing a bus to the African Leadership uh, Conference that President Obama does, that he did last year and said he would do an, um, an annual event with. Um, in August, and then we're going to head over to the continent. So, I'd like to get my panelists, Eric Osiakwan, uh, John Gossier, Damon Baptiste, to introduce themselves and to give you a little bit more information about them. Hello. All right. Um, thank you very much, uh, um, Derek. And uh, I also want to thank the other Derek who connected me to this Derek. Um, who's, who's not here because he's shooting his first show in uh, uh, Kingston, Jamaica. Um, and also to thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity. My name is Eric Osiakwan. Uh, I'm from Ghana, born and bred. Um, and I sort of, I'll give you a short version and hopefully as I speak after um, lunch as well, I'll give some more details. But I'm a technology entrepreneur. Uh, I was one of the pioneers that brought internet to Africa in the late 90s, mid to late 90s. And then <clears throat> fast forward, you know, I managed to do some exits and then I started reinvesting in the next generation of entrepreneurs. And in the process, I met John Gozier, who had come onto the continent as well and started doing some investing. Uh, I used to sit on his board, I guess it's still am. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe you five years after here. Um, and uh, fast forward, um, basically I've invested in nine startups. Uh, one is failed, well, it's failing, maybe we'll revive it uh, in six countries. So I, I'm based out of Ghana, but I'm, I've got a base out in Kenya and South Africa, and now Senegal. Um, and um, uh, coincidentally, John and I caught up, so he, we were both on this panel, he sent me an email and said, 
actually, so I sent an email and said, okay, I'm coming to Miami and we're speaking on this panel. And he responds and says, oh, well, um, yeah, by the way, I'm raising a fund and da 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 da. And I'm also raising a fund. <laughs> and then a, another friend who's an angel investor is also raising a fund. So uh, a bit of interesting coincidence. So we got on WhatsApp and we talked and that sort of stuff. Anyway, so let you know a little bit on our connection. Um, <clears throat> yeah, my name is John Gosier. I'm uh, also a serial tech entrepreneur. I started my first company in Uganda in 2008. Um, I ended up there uh, completely unrelated to business. I can't say I was prophetic or knew that there was any great business opportunities in Africa at the time. I just followed a girl there. <laughs> and, um, you know, it, that relationship didn't work. But uh, while I was there... <laughs> <laughs> While I was there, I started a company, Africa, which um, is the, the company that Eric was speaking of. And he's incredibly humble. Um, definitely one of the people I look up to in the industry, and he's helped us quite a bit. Um, the, uh, the company I started helped businesses and continues to help businesses do business in Africa. So multinationals like Google, Microsoft, Africa, um, Intel, technology companies, NGOs, governments, who are finding themselves on the continent, trying to find ways of, of reaching people and um, delivering services and uh, generally just doing things and, and getting acclimated to that, the business environment in that part of the world. Um, around 2010, I started investing in younger startups. Um, and the reason why uh, is because Africa is a big place. It's nearly four times the size of the United States. Um, so just think about that, four times the size of our country, nearly. Um, and uh, to have a multi, a pan-African technology company in Africa was going to require me to travel a lot. And I don't like to fly. Uh, so even though I fly quite a bit, I would have to fly a lot more if I was doing that. So rather than try and establish offices all across the continent, I just started investing in younger companies. And I was like, you know your country better than I will anyway. Um, and so we, um, you know, are very fortunate and forged a relationship with the U.S. Department of State, uh, started a social impact fund, uh, which is now known as the Africa Fund. Uh, we in, we've invested in 12 companies across the continent and, uh, uh, sorry, 16 companies across the continent in 12 countries. Um, and these are very early stage investments. So think uh, less than $25,000. We're usually the first money in, but we help them get to the next level to get the next, uh, the next money. We've got, um, we've had some, no exits yet, but still great companies that we're excited about. So I'll spare you, you'll hear from me again later, so you can get the rest there. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I just want to thank um, all the organizers and um, Dr. Pondaway Gibson for uh, exposing this community to myself. Um, yesterday, I was uh, very busy because I run programs in New Orleans, but it's, um, it's cold in other places and it's warm here. So please give yourself a round of applause for just being here. <laughs> now, this is very ironic because it uh, seems like history always repeats itself. Um, I've been to uh, South Africa uh, 78 times and um, I've led many, many different uh, trade missions there, including I started the uh, sister city relationship with uh, the city of New Orleans and Durban, South Africa. And I had the privilege to meet uh, President, uh, the late Nelson Mandela, um, in 1998. And I'll be receiving uh, a walk of stars with the late President Nelson Mandela in April uh, as South Africa do an installment of the uh, walk of stars because they just uh, partner with Hollywood, but even more importantly, uh, in the educational side, um, we're opening up a school, uh, Josie, uh, if you're familiar with Johannesburg, they call themselves Josie, <laughs> a Josie uh, Creative Arts Academy, and I was very interested in this whole forum because it gives us a chance to connect as Africans, Africans, uh, African Americans, and I've, I've recently found out from the United Nations that uh, there was a resolution passed in 2011 for the 10th anniversary, well, the 10th, uh, a decade celebration of people of African descent. I don't know if many people know that, but there's an actual resolution that was passed by the United Nations, and we're working with them, so I look forward to forging new relationships with people on the panel. A little background about myself. Um, 
My family happens to be the largest musical family in Louisiana, so we've had a you know pretty much a a, a go kart because of the musicians. My father used to be the band director for Jackie Wilson, so as a musician, uh, traveling around the world uh, with um, doing festivals, and I went on to work for the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival for 25 years, and. I feel this conference could have the same impact as another festival that I helped start that was bought by Tom Warner, which is the Essence Music Festival. And um, I went on with Dr. Pondaway Gibson. We started the, um, the Baptiste Cultural Arts Academy in New Orleans. That's also leading the um, education reform around the United States in education. And I think these gentlemen's skills and the technology, we, we do things in arts education, digital media, STEM, STEAM, um, there's so many things, um, you know, and I think I've, I've asked Derek already if this could be replicated in Durban. Uh, we do have an MOU with the Durban University of Technology, over 27,000 students. I just hosted the, uh, the vice president of the university, Dr. Laverne Samuels, last week. Uh, we have a major relationship with uh, France. France has a lot of uh, Africans from West Africa. And we, we also have an MOU with the <coughs> Port of South Louisiana, which is the largest tonnage port in the Western Hemisphere. So there's a lot of work that we can learn from and invest. But I, I do think it's an opportunity for us to um, rethink about how to invest in the urban youth communities in America that's so often forgotten. Because we have, we, we have established a culture of uh, entertainment around sports, around festival and music, but we seem like we've left the kids out. And that is one of the things that I'm compelled to do. I'm a Hurricane Katrina survivor. And I guess God gave me the privilege to humble myself because I have a son with cerebral palsy. So I do a lot of work with uh, medical hospitals, raising you know, funds for kids with special needs. And there's some great technology that I think we, could, we can explore, but also we could push the new urban kids instead of, you know, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be LeBron Joe's, I mean, LeBron James. But what about being the, uh, the next doctor that, you know, cures cerebral palsy and, and these diseases that has no cure? So those are the things that I think we as a, a community, you know, that this conference could maybe take on a mission and do something like that because it seems like it's a very exciting energy and I'm just very humble and happy to, to be here thanks to the invitation of the, of the, of the organizers and Dr. Pondaway Gibson. said we're glad to have you. Um, I said this last night at the event we had on South Beach and I said that people of color have to be stingy about doing business with other people or with people who look like them. Um, if we look at the African Leadership Forum um, that President Obama did, there were more CEOs in DC during that time than ever before in Washington DC. Um, the reason why is the resources that the continent has. So my question to the panelists, could you explain to the group of people the importance of doing business on the continent, the, the, uh, the opportunity that lives there, um, that other groups, other people, uh, ethnicities see the value in, um, and that we need to be stingy about going after building those relationships and doing business with them? If you look at empirical data on um, returns on investment in Africa, it's incredible, right? And it actually buttresses the point that Africa is a high risk zone. And in, in business, if you take more risks, you get a higher return, right? Unfortunately, this data is not available to a lot of people. So there's this um, risk perception about Africa, and I live through this, right? Um, if you go to talk to investors, you're doing so, oh, Africa is risky, yeah? you know, but if you look at a lot of the big multinationals, US, European companies that invest in Africa, it's incredible the returns they make. And I'm sometimes surprised why they don't say that, they don't make that public, right? And there are a lot of reasons and I don't want to go into that. So, so Africa represents, you may say a huge risk, but huge returns in that sense. Secondly, um, I can, secondly, the 10 of the fastest growing countries in the world today are in Africa. And the part of that data that is not very sort of, there's not a lot of emphasis. People say, oh, it's because those countries are resource rich. 
But actually, if you look at those countries, five of them are, yes, resource countries, so Angola and Nigeria. But the other five are great exponentially due to service, right? They are service-led economies. Um, Ghana is one of them, right? I mean, we don't have, we just found oil, but very little oil, right? So the growth that you are seeing in Africa is not just a resource-based growth, but also a real service sector growth um, story. And I think uh, McKinsey has done quite a bit of work to sort of lay this out. Uh, if you Google this, you'll find some of that data. Um, so the growth we see in Africa is not just resources. And that's very, very important uh, to, to pin down. Um, <clears throat> the other thing about Africa is, and now I'll speak about technology space because that's what I know. I mean, there's a lot of growth you've seen in financial services, real estate, et cetera. Um, is that I think Africa came from the back and literally overtook the world. Um, 15 years ago, there were more landlines in Manhattan than the whole of Africa. And just think about it, Africa is four times the size of the United States, right? 15, 10 years, just a decade after that, Africa has more cell phones than the rest of the world, right? So something radically happened in the last 15 years where Africa came from the back and then into the front in terms of communication. And this has been largely private sector led. And the interesting part is that a lot of these companies are companies that were started by Africans in Africa. Take MTN, for example. I'm sure you heard about MTN. MTN never existed 15 years ago. Now it's a big South African multinational. Um, the Indians wanted to buy the South African and said, no, we, are not, we, we know you can offer double the price, but we will not sell it because we, we're proud that we have a company that is South African. Right? Um, they said all that Mo Ibrahim started a sold to Batia at all for $2 billion and... Uh, sorry, five billion. Um, so, so the technology revolution has been very, very exponential in Africa. Now, if you look at the impact of mobile on different economies, Africa is number one. Um, it's currently the impact of mobile in Asia is about 3.1%, Africa is about 4.6%. In the US is about 2.1%, and same, about the same for um, Europe. That tells you that mobile is not just sort of a luxury thing where, you know, but, but it's really having impact on economics and the average person. So uh, my grandma, you know, couldn't read and write, but she can play with a cell phone. You know, she can pick up the phone. I didn't need to do anything exponent, you know, extraordinary to get her using it, right? Um, so so the, the next thing that is happening from where I sit is that the cell phones become the platform that is going to now create the second level of disruption, mm -hmm. which is going to start facing bottlenecks within the market economy. So you see, for example, one of the big things that has happened is mobile money. So in the developed world, um, your credit card or your debit card or your card is your main form of transaction. This is not catch on in Africa, but the mobile phone is not a device. It's where people have their money. Right? So you have your money on in debit or credit card. My money is in the phone. So the mobile phone has become the device that is allowing people to now store money and do transactions. Right. And, and you couldn't think about that 15 years ago. Right. So that's a huge opportunity. And I think now it's in the US. I mean, I'm finding companies in the US now that are doing mobile money, and they're doing it in different interesting ways. I think we had an example on one of the panels earlier today. Um, so anyway, um, I think I will allow my colleagues to jump in a little bit, but those are some of the things that are really, really interesting. M-Pesa is one of those companies in Kenya that does the money and is expanding. Uh, I think it's owned by Vodafone. Yeah. Vodafone owns a portion of it, and they're expanding to India. So that just lets you know the direction in which that technology is going. Just to, to put it into context a bit, um, M-Pesa, which is the service that uh, Eric was talking about, um, now accounts for 12% of Kenya's GDP. Um, this is all the money that, the, that goes through the country, 12% of it goes through a cell phone network, which is now the biggest bank in that country. Um, it, th th that should really drive home the fact that this was incredibly disruptive and it hasn't worked in quite the same way in other African countries, but the opportunity is there. What happened was the banks realized that a cell phone company was now the biggest bank in Kenya, and they've been squashing these types of innovations throughout the rest of Africa deliberately, they, you know, with policy. They don't want to see this happen again because obviously uh, banking is their, their business. 
and um, they don't want to be in the cell phone business, although they are quickly have, having to, to change that strategy. Um, to go back to the question, though, um, I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't quite use the word stingy. Um, I would say deliberate is, um, is, is definitely what needs to happen. Um, when I'm in Africa, I'm always just in awe of all the um, development that's happening, the, the energy. You know, it's almost the same way I feel when I go to Manhattan and there's just people everywhere and it's just exciting to be there. I feel that way every single place I've been on the continent. I've been to more than half the continent at this point. And, you know, it doesn't look the same. It's not like, you know, Manhattan. It's not skyscrapers. But what it is is, is people just trying to figure out how to make the best with what they've got. And this image of Africa asking us for charity, in my experience, is a myth. They're not looking for charity. They're looking for jobs. They're looking for investment. And they're looking for opportunities to do for themselves. And which is why I, it's actually what brought me into the investment space was like, well, on one hand, I can grow a company by hiring people all across the continent. But on the other hand, they would then work for me. What can I do to help them work for themselves and then have their people work for them? And so I started investing in companies for that reason. Um, the, the other thing that is important is other people do see this opportunity. China is all over Africa right now. Korea is all over Africa right now. India, uh, we already know, the, you know what happened when Europe was there and you know, our relationship in, in the United States with Africa is tenuous, um, it, but it hasn't caught up to the opportunity that exists today. And my worry is that in 30 years, if I go back to Africa, um, as much as I do now, I'll be dealing with more Chinese business people than I will be African business people. And that's why I think this is important. Right, and just to piggyback off of that, uh, in, in- Nothing wrong with the Chinese. And right, in 19, well, in 1998, when I made my first trip, I thought, wouldn't it have been great if uh, America would have spent more dollars on uh, trade and investment with Africa, South Africa, instead of the wars? Because that's when we, you know, after 9-11, 2001, I think um, we started, you know, having a series of, of, of wars. And one of the things that South Africa has is the natural min minerals to create um, the uh, nuclear wars. I mean, I'm, the, the nuclear uh, bombs and stuff like that. So most people that doesn't have the uh, expertise of knowledge about Africa and the natural resources may not understand that um, in some parts of Africa, it may really be the centerpiece of trading and investment for the entire world. And I think we have, a, we have an opportunity to be deliberate investment, to have a deliberate format to say that this trade mission that will start in Miami, because I've led many different trade missions. One, uh, I was a consultant for South African Airways, which is one of the best airlines on the African continent. Another for, uh, <coughs> for the Port of South Louisiana, which there was a recent investment with Sasso Oil, which happens to have the largest single natural investment in the United States history of $20 billion in Lake Charles, Louisiana, that I only got to think they didn't give me the $20 billion you know, for making the, the uh, connection. But changing on uh, natural uh, liquid in, into gas um, because of all the natural minerals and the oil and gas that Louisiana, is a, it's a natural, and also South Africa is, um, is the owner of uh, SAB Brewery, uh, South Africa. Just so many companies now, but we have an opportunity to bring a delegation there. Uh, has anybody in the audience been to South Africa before? I raise a hand, okay. Um, I think we should really, um, because the trip is in October, there's several opportunities you know, to really promote it, not, to, not only into the, the Florida community in Miami, but you can ask people from around the United States to join you. Also people from uh, the African diaspora, you know, some of the Caribbean uh, folks, and then that we can be very deliberate. There's also uh, some things that I can share with you, like the, the Joy of Jazz, which is, uh, it's in September at the, um, at the uh, in Santon, at the Santon Convention Center that was normally in the Newtown Precinct. So their culture in South Africa is a little bit different uh, because it's, it's also based around entertainment and having fun, but it's also where people really have meetings and meet. So there is 
tremendous opportunity. I think um, after leading many different delegations, this is a time that we could uh, change the game and take a, take a lesson from the Chinese because they've, you know, they just didn't wait on anyone. They just went in uh, and set up shops in townships. There's, there's China shops in some townships where a normal American may be afraid to go in a township that have you know, two or three million people. You, know, you have another country that's just going up and setting up shop that uh, may not speak you know, the African dialect, but they, they you know, understand that this is a great opportunity because of the potential buyers and the new cell phone customers that South Africa was way ahead of the United States in technology with cell phones you know, back in 1998. So um, I wish folks really tell friends that have the, the means uh, to travel and to maybe take an interest in education and uh, digital media technology is probably one of the, the largest formats that could be in, invested in and create new mediums for uh, content. So we, we went to Cape Town, we were in Cape Town and uh, we had a bus tour. And these men took us around the white area and they showed us everything. And T was in the bus. So when we get up, get up at the hotel, and T said, uh, you forgot that, huh? I'm listening, I'm listening. Okay. <laughs> so T said, uh, is that the tour? I said, yes, we finished. He said, no, 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 no. We want to go to see the real people. <laughs> right? You remember now? <laughs> oh. <laughs> so they had to take us, you know, to see to the, you know, yeah, to, to, to the community. Like you, you don't have to get on the bus. You have to see them and say hello. And, uh, and we had a uh, lot of people that uh, we saw that this is a real people from South Africa. Right? In addition to the trade mission that we were on at the time, in addition to the, uh, the trade mission that we were on, uh, you know, just to get back home uh, to really touch our land and, and feel uh, connected uh, was a, a, an overwhelming feeling uh, that we had, that I had personally on that particular trip. Uh, to South Africa, and we not only went to uh, Johannesburg, but we were up in Harare, Zimbabwe, and also Cape Town, and we established some contacts. Daniel, uh, in his transportation business, uh, was able to establish a relationship there uh, with the continent, uh, with, with the, the country. So we are, uh, we've had opportunities uh, now the world has changed, technology is changing, uh, the way we communicate and our access. Um, and the competition is there as with China and India. So we, we see that we've got a lot to do and some steps to make. So uh, it's interesting that we're bringing this dialogue. And since then, I'm still doing business in Zimbabwe. So just so, because we're going to go back into the session, but I wanted to also thank the panelists and say if you are interested in joining the trade mission with the Chamber, um, the trip is going to be the 16th of October through the 23rd of October. If you are interested, please come and see me. You can give me your card or I'll have a brief sign-up sheet um, so that we can get back to you with the date. The next big event we're having is going to be in... June, June 26th, where the ambassador of South Africa is coming to speak to us again. Um, and we'll be finalizing the trip plans. Mr. Batiste, our panel, and other people will be playing an intricate role of making sure that we get to see the best of South Africa while we're there. So please come join us and tell other people if they're interested in doing business in South Africa or on the continent as a whole. This is the start of really figuring out ways to grow businesses and create that sister city relationship. So please come see me if you want to go on a trip. And also, the panelists um, each have a keynote, 20 minute keynote. So if you wanted to hear more about um, what they do and tapping into Africa, stay tuned for the next session after our next panel. Um, and then they're gonna have a question and answer session. So if you have questions for them, stay tuned. You have a chance to ask your questions in the big stage. All right, thank you for coming. <laughs>